This week, it's a Rocky Mountain High with Rob Blake. The NHL Players Association presents Be a Player, the Hockey Show. Brought to you by EA Sports NHL 2001. If it's in the game, it's in the game. Welcome to Be a Player, the Hockey Show, coming to you from the Colorado State Capitol here in Denver. I'm Brett Lindros. Well, right now, I'm exactly one mile above sea level. And later on in the show, I'm going to sit down with the newest addition of the high-flying avalanche, defenseman Rob Blake. Now, the avalanche are the envy of the league with Blake, Raymond Bork, and Adam Foote on their blue line. And I'm going to talk to Rob about how he's preparing for the upcoming playoffs. On after the game, we have former Broad Street bully Jimmy Watson. But first, one of the best young goaltenders in the league, Brent Johnson of the St. Louis Blues on Next Generation. Next Generation, brought to you by Gatorade. Is it in you? Four line straight away. Oh, bad. Back door. Hines robbed by Brent Johnson. I always liked goaltending, you know, and then, and then as I was getting older, you know, I, I found myself, you know, so big that I could go down and cover most of the net, so that's what I started to do, and uh, I caught on, you know, and I, I love the game, and it's just uh, been great so far. And the puck in front of her. Shot Johnson, the save. My dad played for St. Louis in Pittsburgh. He was uh, mostly uh, um, in the minors and uh, played a long time in the WHA. And uh, he was a goaltender as well. So, you know, him and I were the first uh, father-son goaltending combination for the same team, which was pretty nice to have. You look at half our team, half our team has almost been through Worcester and uh, played there at some, at some point in their career. We had a pretty strong team, you know, and, uh, you know, the goals against went, kept going down and down, and it was, uh, it was nice, you know. Um, a good bunch of guys there, and, you know, the puck was hitting me there for a while. I came into camp just trying to, you know, trying to stick and, you know, trying to play as, uh, as best I could. And uh, I got here and then I ended up going on like a seven game winning streak and tying a record for the Blues. And, you know, it's, it's like, it's like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm here and I'm doing this well. And then you can't, uh, can't win every game, but um, it's, uh, it's been fun so far. It's been a great time and great experience. I just want to be ready for the playoffs and, uh, you know, we just want to pass the first couple rounds and, and or actually the first round, I should say, past the first round, and that's all we have to worry about, you know, and, and you know, I think we have a good chance this year. It's now time for the Be A Player trivia question. To play along, send your answer to the NHLPA's website at www.nhlpa.com slash be a player. All correct answers will be entered in a random draw with a chance to win an NHL 2001 video game courtesy of EA Sports or an autographed NHLPA jersey. For complete contest rules, check out NHLPA.com. Name the player who holds the record for most career overtime goals. Coming up, Brett goes one-on-one -on -one with the newest Colorado Avalanche. You get to know the guys on the team, but uh, the thing is that you play so many games and you play right away. We play the next night. Uh, that's when you start realizing you can fit in pretty quick. This week on Hit Parade, our plays explode with Matthew Goodband and Hello Time Bomb. We'll see if I'm kidding. Quick shot scores! Donald Bashir! Man, was this a hit.
Be a Player gives you a chance to ask your favorite NHL player a question. For your chance to participate, visit NHLPA.com. Dustin from Edmonton, Alberta, asked Patrick Watt, Do you have any tips for tall goalies on helping them widen their legs when they're in the butterfly position? Here's what Patrick had to say. Well, I think butterfly, it's important that uh, you're not too open because you want to be able to move a, a, a across very easily. And, and a lot of mistake from young, young goaltenders is when they have a very wide butterfly, they can't uh, be able to uh, to move side to side. And, and uh, basically, butterfly, it's, it's, it's just uh, important that you go on the ice as square as possible, make sure you, your pads are touching the ice. And, and I think it go true. And, and in order to do that, I think you just start to slowly go down and, and look what's the perfect butterfly for you and, 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 and learn to go at your pace and, and work on it. And I think on the long run, it, it should, should work. I mean, it's not something that happened overnight. It's something that you definitely have to practice a lot. We're here now at Chopper's Dinner, an annual charity event that's put on by the NBA's Denver Nuggets and the NHL's Colorado Avalanche. Now tonight would be a great night for Rob Blake to get to know some of his brand new teammates. And they're used to that around here. Each year, the NHL's Colorado Avalanche seem to add a marquee player late in the season. A couple of years ago, it was Theron Fleury. Last year, it was a veteran Raymond Bork. And this year, the Avalanche are betting that Rob Blake is going to be the secret ingredient that's going to lead them to playoff success. Here's part one of my conversation with Rob Blake as he prepares for the playoffs. Goes to Blake. Blake goes in on goal. Calvary with five power play goes to Blake and he scores! A one-timer. Straight pass is cut. Blake is in. Score! Rob Blake tucked it out to the Robbie played 11 seasons with one franchise. At what point did you think you might get traded during this season? I kind of knew uh, at the beginning of this season, uh, you know, we had a, a meeting there right into training camp and uh, both sides kind of sat down we listened to, and we knew we were coming to this type of a situation but uh, you know we could tell from that time that uh, inevitably there would be a trade uh, later in the season I i've always thought that throughout my career that you know i'd end up being in los angeles and staying there but uh, again when we started having these meetings uh, you know one in the beginning of the season one at christmas time and then uh, you know one three days before the trade uh, you know it's pretty evident that both sides were going to go their separate ways and uh, you know, there was no hard feelings or anything. It was, it was good. The air was clean, and uh, uh, you know, we were just kind of waiting for the trade to happen. Number two scoring defenseman in the National Hockey League. There were trade rumors surrounding you for weeks, even months. How much of a distraction was that? Well, I mean, from pretty much day one, there was about 10 games early in the season that uh, it really was bothering me. And I mean, you know, you start thinking of different teams, different places, and that. And I kind of had to make sure I put that out of my mind. Uh, you know, away from the away from the rink, there was distractions. I mean, obviously talking about it every day, but uh, I kind of kept the lines of communication uh, pretty good with the guys on the team. Every time I had a meeting with management, I met with the players after, and I kind of told them what the situation was because. Uh, you know, those are the guys that will support you through the trade and that. And they had to know firsthand what was going on. Uh, we made a point that when we came to the rink, and, and I made it known to the guys on the team too, that we were going to do what we could to win the games. And uh, whatever happened would happen later on. When the trade finally happened, how did you find out? And what were the chain of events that happened after? The, the president and, and Dave Taylor flew in to have a meeting with me uh, in Minnesota. So we met and, and we talked and, and, you know, it was obvious that things weren't going to get done. And they said that, you know, a trade would happen here pretty quick. And uh, we flew to Calgary that night and, and I had gone out for dinner with uh, Nelson Emerson and Maddie Nordstrom. And we were sitting at dinner and a phone call rang and obviously I knew what the, the call was. It was a trade. And, uh, it was kind of funny because uh, right after that the phone just starts ringing. It's all the guys on the team, and so they all came out, and you know we sat around, we talked for a while. It was difficult, you know. That night it wasn't too big of a deal. I was excited that it was Colorado and that, but the next day when you got you got to say goodbye to the guys on the team, and you're not losing friends or anything, but those are the guys you've played with for so many years and, and done so much with. Uh, you know that was difficult, and then then you arrive in Colorado, and it's a. Uh, it's like you're a rookie walking in the room. Uh, you, know, you meet Ray Bork, Joe Sackick, uh, Forsberg, all these guys, and you get to know the guys on the team. But uh, the thing is, that you play so many games and you play right away. We played the next night. Uh, that's when you start realizing you can fit in pretty quick. In LA, you're the captain of the team, the leader of the team. You walk into a dressing room like Colorado. How does your role change when you look around the room and there's so many leaders? 
Well, I think the biggest thing is you learn it. You know, you come in and obviously you're going to be quiet. You, you don't want to step on any toes. You want to find what, where your spot is and everything. But for me, uh, it's almost a winning at atmosphere that uh, that I've got to learn again. You know, obviously in LA we've had good teams, but a lot of times we're fighting for the the playoffs, trying to get in the seventh, the sixth, or eighth spot. And here in uh, in Colorado, you're already number one in the league. You're looking for the playoffs, so that attitude uh, every game is a little different. It's more of a winning attitude. You know, you go out, you do your job, you're going to win that game. Colorado has to be one of the favorites in the West. Who do you think some of the other teams are that might give you guys some trouble? Well, I think you can see the rivalries that uh, Colorado has developed just because of playing these teams in the, in the playoffs for the last couple of years. So obviously Dallas is going to be there. I think any player in the league that's ever watched Colorado Detroit knows the intensity is there and both teams are fighting for the top spot. Uh, you know, St. Louis making a few changes. They're going to get, uh, you know, Pronger McInnes back uh, before the playoffs. They're going to be a very difficult team. But uh, the West right now is tough. I mean, uh, you know, obviously L.A. is fighting for that eighth spot. Uh, Edmonton's been on a roll. So all these teams are, are difficult. But uh, the thing we have focused right now is we want to remain number one in the league so we have those home games. A player's stick is in a sense an extension of their arm. NHL players will try out countless types of sticks, feeling out what works best for them. For you, you have to first look at the shaft of the stick. If you have a small hand, you don't want the shaft to be too big. It'll be difficult to handle the puck. Also, you have to look at the curve. If the curve is too big, you can't control the puck and make a pass on your forehand, on your backhand. A big curve doesn't necessarily mean a big shot. And also, there's the stiffness of a stick. Some players like it really firm, others like it whippy. For Brett Hall, he uses his stick very effectively to get a good torque when he takes his shot. And then there's the aluminum stick. So many players like to have the aluminum stick because it feels lighter. It's also a little bit more durable. Using a shaft over and over again can make sense monetarily as well. And also, you look at the extra blade. You can mix and match the type of blade that you like. In the end, it's your stick and it's going to be your preference. What feels good usually is a good idea to use. Welcome back. Continuing my conversation with Rob Blake. Rob, we've already discussed some of your most recent events, but take me back to the beginning, to Simcoe, Ontario. Where did hockey fit into your life back then? Yeah, well, I grew up on a, on a farm, so we had a couple of ponds there, and uh, had an older brother and sister that both, uh, you know, played hockey and, and, and figure skate at the same time. So every every weekend there was always something going on in the pond, whether it would be a, you know, a pickup game with some neighbors and things. So that's kind of how I got into into hockey. But I think growing up in a smaller town in Canada, you know, the first thing you do is probably put skates on. <laughs> how much of a culture shock was it for you, a guy from Simcoe, Ontario, to end up in the bright lights of L.A.? Well, it was funny because I had played three years at college and I'd never been on a plane before or anything. And, you know, so that it was a spring break in, in college and we just finished our season. And, and so I signed that contract and I kind of thought that I would, you know, remain in school for the rest of that year and just go up to L.A. the next year. But uh, they wanted us there right away. And, you know, you have no clue what you're what you're going to expect. And I can remember the first time I walked in the room and uh, the first guy I meet was Wayne Gretzky. And obviously, you know, any kid growing up in Canada watching the, the greatest player in the world, and he comes over and introduces himself as Wayne. He goes, hi, I'm Wayne Gretzky. It's like I, I didn't know who that was, you know, so. But that's the kind of guy he was and the rest of the players where they came, they made you feel real comfortable. You know, you walk in after the game and you know, Kurt Russell, Goldie Hawn, Sylvester Stallone, they're in the room all the time. And I just thought that's how every NHL team was. You know, later on you learn that we had a real special thing there, obviously, with Wayne. But probably the best was John Candy. He used to, you know, fly around quite a bit with us. And I can remember even, uh, I think it was Game 7 in Toronto, uh, he, him coming in probably an hour before the game. and giving like a little uh, mock pep talk to all the guys, trying to get all the guys going, everyone was laughing, but it was a great way to loosen, th I mean, game seven, obviously, you guys are pretty tight and pretty tense, but it was a pretty good way to loosen things up. Tell me about the run to the cup in 1993. What was that like? 
Oh, it was amazing. And I mean, the, the, even the more special thing probably is that we had to play Toronto in the semifinals. You know, obviously uh, close to home, my family, everybody was there. So, you know, we went to Game 7, which is probably the most exciting time. We beat them and then had Montreal in the final. So, uh, but at the time, you know, you're young and, and I mean, it was my th third year in the league. So, I, you know, you lose a game, you're sitting on the bus and I'm like, well, you know, next year we'll go back and we'll, we'll try to get back in the Stanley Cup and win it then. And, you know, nine years later, when you haven't got out of the first round, you realize that when that opportunity comes around, you better take advantage of it. The Canadians win the Stanley Cup! At the end of the season, you become an unrestricted free agent. How are you going to approach that situation? Well, definitely during the season, uh, you know, especially when we went into Toronto there uh, probably a month before everything happened, there, there was a lot of talk in that. Uh, you know, it'd be great. I, I'd love to play at home uh, closer to my family and things, but, uh, you know, right now we're, we're going to do what we can with Colorado, and, uh, you know, Colorado's a great city also. I mean, uh, it's funny, you know, I never thought I would have stayed in L.A. and after 12 years there, I'll probably never leave there. You know, I'll visit back home and things, but I think that where you end up playing and where, where you enjoy is where you're going to stay. When you look at the makeup of the Canadian Olympic team for Salt Lake, the veterans are a given. Is there any young players in the league that you feel deserve a shot? Like you said, you have the, the guys that have been around a while, there's Steve Yeisman, you know, Joe Sackick. These guys are going to be the leaders of the team. And, uh, you know, it's going to be interesting, Mario Lemieux going to come back and play him. You know, what he's done in the NHL this year, you know, it's going to be a big help to the Olympic team. But, you know, there's guys, I think, like a guy like Ryan Smith in Edmonton. You know, to play against him every night, you understand how good of a player he is. And if you surround him with all these other great players, it's going to make them that much better. But I think that Canada did last Olympics, which was real beneficial, is they, they found different roles for players. And that's probably the hardest thing. When you go to the Olympics and take all that talent and all those players that are used to playing the most minutes on every team, you have to tell them their roles and the players have to accept their roles. But that, that's part of being a professional. you got two weeks over there for, for one job to win a gold medal. And then practice your breakaways just in case. <laughs> well, I think if, it, if they went to a shootout, it'd be like probably number 26 or 27, <laughs> if, depending on how many guys they have. Next, from Broad Street Bullies to Broad Street Mansions on After the Game. When I retired from the Flyers, I got into renovating houses initially, and then I was also building houses on speculation, you know, just building them to sell them. Be a player, the hockey show, sponsored by EA Sports, NHL 2001. If it's in the game, it's in the game. Welcome back. For over 30 years, Mile High Stadium was the home of two-time Super Bowl champion Denver Broncos. Now next season, the Broncos are going to move across the street to the nearly completed Invesco Field at Mile High. The stadium is over 75% completed and will be ready for play in the fall. Now former Philadelphia Flyer Jimmy Watson won two Stanley Cups with the infamous Broad Street Bullies. And as you'll see on this installment of After the Game, you'll find out that he has a construction project all of his own these days. Throughout his nine-year NHL career, Jimmy Watson relentlessly patrolled the blue line for the Philadelphia Flyers. Alongside his brother Joe, the five-time All-Star was part of a team that captured two Stanley Cups in 1974 and 1975. During that time, however, Jimmy Watson and the Flyers became more legendary for their on-ice antics than their winning record. Being a part of the Broad Street Bullies was an experience uh, that you could only imagine at the time, we were considered to be a real aggressive, hard-nosed team. The spectrum is on Broad Street, of course, hence the Broad Street bullies. But I was not one of the, the, the combatants uh, that often as far as the fighting was concerned. <laughs> Jimmy left the Broad Street bullies when he retired in 1982. As well as his brother Joe, who works for the Flyers organization, Jimmy is still involved in the game of hockey. I'm involved in an ice rink in Aston, Delaware County, Pennsylvania. I run clinics over here at the rink. Uh, I run hockey schools. I coach my uh, second son, who's 16. He's a midget age kid. I coach him here. Between that and coming over and helping manage the rink, I also am in the construction business. I build houses in the Philadelphia region. Oh boy, foyer looks great. I'm so happy the way it turned out. When I retired from the Flyers, I got into renovating houses initially, and I decided to build my own home. Built my own home, and it kind of grew from there to where I was actually building custom homes for other people, and then I was also building houses on speculation, you know, just building them to sell them. So that's how it evolved, and I've been doing it now since 1982. So you get a lot of nice flow to the house. 
And uh, so I, I really like the design because of that. It's very comfortable and you can move from room to room very easily. If you have your house plan that you want to have built, that's fine. I can take that plan. I would price it out for you. I would present my, my bid to you. You would okay it. Once you okayed it, then I would take that and just start to you know, get all the approvals from the different townships. And I would go in the ground. I would contract the different contractors to come in. I would oversee them, uh, making sure that the quality of their work was up to, to my standards. Um, and I would just I would do all the pricing, uh, write all the checks to the contractors, uh, meet with you periodically at the site, show you how the job is progressing. If you did not have your own plan and you liked something that I've already built, we could just use that plan. That's another way we can go about it. So I'm basically there just to make sure the job runs smoothly, it runs efficiently, the job gets done in a timely fashion, and you're happy. I really uh, take a lot of pride in what I do. I want the house to be nice. I want it to be real nice. I want the customer to be happy. Because frankly, if they're happy, then I'm going to be happy. Um, and then I, I expect to get future business from that. There's a number of reasons why I want to do a good quality job. For the pride, the fulfillment I get from that, and uh, the fact that it enables me to kind of relax and enjoy myself. Be a Player Trivia is brought to you by EA Sports NHL 2001. If it's in the game, it's in the game. Who holds the record for most overtime goals during the regular season? Glenn Anderson. No, not Glenn Anderson. He's in the playoffs. Now this guy, playoffs. yeah, he's playoffs. This guy's uh, still active. I know it is. It's uh, Claude Lemieux. It's not Claude. No? <laughs> Jaeger. Not, not Jaeger. Mario? No. I'd say uh, Timo Salani. Is he uh, North American? Okay, so he's North American. Brian Leach. You guys said these were easy. Right now? Right now. Steve, Steve Thomas. Thomas. Was this in a press yeah. guide or something? Why does everyone know so, this? Oh, we played with him. He yeah. told us every day. So. <laughs> Steve Thomas? Is that who you think? Uh, yeah, I don't think so. I like that. Answer. Steve Thomas? I like it. Yeah? Like You're it. three for three. He has 11. He has 11. Minute into overtime, wide open. Pekka gave the puck away. Shoots, he scores! Thomas! Before I left Denver, I thought I'd come up here to Lookout Mountain to get a bird's eye view of the city and the surrounding area. Well, that does it for this season of Be a Player of the Hockey Show. I'd like to thank Rob Blake for joining us this week and all of the players who participated throughout the season. Special hats off to our production crew for a job well done this year. Thanks for watching Be a Player of the Hockey Show. NHLPA.com is your source for the latest stats, scores, and NHL player information. Click on Be a Player for the latest show information or send us your questions and comments. You'll find it all at NHLPA.com. Brett Lindros is clothing supplied by The Coop, clothing for men, Toronto. So I saw Simmer with his hair and I was like, oh, Simmer, turn the channel. Yeah. I saw the hair and the good hits and I was like, oof. There were trade rumors surrounding you for weeks, even months. How much of a distraction? <laughs> Good simple boy. <laughs> I don't even know why I do such things. <laughs> All right.